Mr. Speaker, it's customary at the end of the budget process for the leader to give a speech, being an acknowledgement to the chair of the House. We have come to the end of budget 2022 and the COS. Sir, this budget has been both unusual and memorable for a number of reasons. First, although we have been battling the pandemic for over two years, this is the first time that it reached the chamber. Some MPs were close contacts of those who were COVID positive and took leave of absence out of an abundance of caution. Special seating arrangements were put in place so that they could feel at ease about attending. A number of MPs, myself included, contracted COVID and had to sit out the proceedings for a while. The virus was not discriminatory. Members of the ruling party had it. Uh, Ms. Sylvia Lim, Ms. Herting Ru from Workers' Party got it. Prof. Hun, uh, nominated MP, got it as well. So it reached everyone. But I would like to thank colleagues for their care and concern and expressions of support for all those who were ill. Uh, let me especially thank Mr. Louis Ng, who uh, gave the most uh, encouragement and support, primarily because he wanted me to get well in time to answer his PQs. <laughs> He did, he did add as an afterthought that he was concerned for my health as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ng. Despite this, we did not allow COVID to disrupt our work. 66 speakers spoke over the two and a half days of debate on the budget statement. Seven days of COS in which 639 cuts were filed. We spent a total of 73 hours debating the fiscal policy of the government and the ministry's estimates of expenditures. Approximately 130 PQs were taken in the past two weeks. This is the highest level of participation in the last five years, despite the reduced numbers of MPs able to attend Parliament. The second, this budget was developed against the backdrop of climate change and climate risk, which is becoming more urgent by the day. Third, just as we were about to debate the budget, the world changed with the situation in Ukraine reminding us once again that independence, the right to self-determination, and territorial sovereignty are precious and cannot be taken for granted, and why small countries like Singapore must continue to advocate and uphold an international order that is rules-based and principled. Against this backdrop, we debated and approved one of our most transformative budgets to date, setting ourselves on a path towards becoming a fairer, greener, more inclusive, and overall more progressive Singapore. Let me summarize what we have done by approving this budget. With this budget, we will be strengthening our business ecosystem and building stronger Singaporean enterprises. The Singapore Global Enterprises and Singapore Global Executive Program will help us produce companies and Singaporean talent that are globally competitive. Budget 2022 will also revitalize and support our F&B, retail, and tourism sectors. We will continue to press on with our digitalization journey while ensuring that those who are less comfortable with technology are not sidelined. This budget affirms our support for our workers, especially low-wage workers, the progressive wage model, progressive wage credit scheme, an enhancement of the Workfare Income Supplement Scheme will support and uplift our low-wage workers. This unique approach is the outcome of intensive effort between the tripartite partners, the labour movement, employers and government. We can now continue to develop a strong and skilled Singaporean workforce while enabling employers to meet genuine manpower needs by hiring foreigners with relevant skills to complement our local workforce through increases in the minimum qualifying salaries for work passes and the Compass Points-based framework. We are speeding up our transition to a greener, more sustainable society with the review of our climate plan and the setting of more ambitious goals, the increase in carbon tax, R&D into sustainability, cutting emissions, energy efficiency, renewable and clean energy and zero waste. As this is not without trade-offs and costs, Singaporeans will be engaged in this endeavour so that we can all have a clear understanding of what it will take to achieve our green ambitions, even as we move forward on them. We have renewed and strengthened our social compact. Cost of living, inflation are very much on people's minds. 
Almost all members spoke on this in one way or another. Approving the household support package and other help schemes paves the way for us to help Singaporeans through this tough period. We heard assurance from the Minister of Finance during his roundup speech that the government would not hesitate to take further actions to protect jobs and to help households and businesses deal with increased costs if need be. We have ensured we can meet and pay for the healthcare needs of our rapidly aging population. With Healthier SG, we have the blueprint for a new model of healthcare of the future anchored on prevention as well as cure. We have continued our educational reforms, reducing pressure and stress so our children can focus on the joy of learning. Mid-year examinations for all primary and secondary levels will be removed by 2023 and streaming will be removed fully by 2024. We are redoubling our efforts to bridge inequality and make sure no one is left behind. Social service delivery will be improved. Comlink will be scaled up nationwide and uplift expanded. There will be more opportunities for the differently able. We reaffirmed the importance of family. 2022 will be the year of celebrating families and strengthening support for families. All these good things cannot come to pass without funding. To enable them to happen, we enhanced and strengthened our tax structure. We, uh, we will adjust the corporate tax system to take into account BEPS. We increase the progressivity of our personal income tax. We raise wealth taxes through targeted increases in property tax and tax on luxury cars. And we increase GST with a significant package to buffer the impact and adjust the timing. Most Singaporeans will not feel the impact of the GST increase for many years because of the support measures we designed. By coupling GST with the GSTV, we ensure that the lower income, including many retirees, will continue to pay less GST than the headline rate. We will study further support if the inflation situation worsens. And in Parliament, the budget process saw robust debate. The value of robust debate is that it helps to crystallise the issues and it lets, ones, it lets people see where MPs and parties stand. And I thought it might be helpful here if I just summarise the difference in approach between the government and the opposition, in particular the Workers' Party, not to reignite a whole debate on this again, but just to summarise what the different philosophical approaches are so that people can look at it and, and make their own judgments and determination. On the government side, the structures that we have put in place are ones we believe are fair and progressive. There's GST, yes, but it will not hurt the low income because of the permanent GST voucher scheme and the assurance package will help all Singaporeans households, not just the low income, cope with the transition and the GST voucher scheme provides permanent assistance. Everyone contributes, but those who have more contribute more. Those with less also contribute, but a lesser amount and receive more in return. Keeping the tax burden manageable for all, including businesses, so that there is incentive for all to work hard, do well and enjoy the benefits of their hard work even as they contribute to our re revenues. We still maintain the protection of our reserves and we use the income on our reserves equitably, 50% for this generation, 50% for the next. The Workers' Party has a different philosophical approach. Uh, they have preferred not to raise GST, but to, I don't think there's any dispute that there is a genuine and real need though to fund healthcare going forward and that there is a need for increased revenue. To achieve additional revenue of 3.5 billion a year, the net effect of their various proposals is to ta tax large companies more, tax the rich, or use more of the reserves. I mean, no matter which way you cut it, it, it boils down to those three things. Tax companies more, tax the rich more, or use more of the reserves. From our perspective, it's too early to adjust corporate taxes as it will depend on the evolving rules of BEPS 2.0. And even if we're able to collect more in corporate taxes for the revenue for BEPS 2.0, we will have to use these revenues for additional measures to enhance our overall competitiveness 
and ensure that we can continue to attract our fair share of investments. On taxing the rich, there are ramifications on whether we'll drive away talent and wealth, and that will be bad for Singaporeans. In reality, wealth is mobile. Higher taxes on a small group of people at the top, who are extremely low mobile, will eventually lead to higher taxes for upper middle income or even middle income groups. Using more of the reserves means leaving less behind for the next generation and imposing higher taxes on them. So I just lay this out at the end of the day so that people can reflect, make their own conclusions and, and see how they wish to, to, to view this. But I thought when all was said and done and the, death set, the dust settled after the debate, it's good just to crystallize the two different positions so that people will have a more meaningful insight as to what the different propositions actually mean. Next, with more opposition members in parliament, it's natural that our debates will get more robust. That is par for the course. However, in this session, we are also reminded that whilst robust debate is good, it is also important that members maintain decorum in their actions, both in and outside of the House. The standing orders are there for a reason. Timelines and deadlines are also there for a reason, to enable us to conduct parliamentary business efficiently, but also effectively. I therefore urge members to be mindful of this so that for future debates, we can have all the cut and thrust that we desire, but at the same time, observing all due proprieties. Mr. Speaker, I would like to conclude by thanking everyone who has contributed to Budget 2022. Let me begin by thanking members of this House for their strong support and active participation in the Budget and COS debates. It has been a tiring but rewarding two weeks. The Budget was the product of strong input from Singaporeans from all walks of life. We engaged widely, took in feedback. It reflects our citizens' needs, aspirations, and does its best to address their concerns. I would also like to express my gratitude to all of the public servants who have been working so hard on this on top of their regular work. Many have had to learn on the job. <clears throat> Some have taken on additional COVID fighting roles over the past two years or so, and then have had to deal with budget. Um, it has been a tiring time for them, but they soldier on because when they signed up for public service, they knew they also signed up to serve, even at personal cost in terms of family time and rest. I would also like to thank the Deputy Leader uh, for covering for me in my absence. And on behalf of the House, I would like to thank you, Mr. Speaker, and your deputies for, providing over, for presiding over the proceedings with patience and forbearance. We're also grateful to the Clerk of Parliament, the Parliament Secretariat, the staff, the interpreters and translators, all of whom have been working in overdrive these last few weeks. May we show our appreciation for them. Thank you very much.